Uh, thanks, Jane, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, the topic of evolution. And specifically, I'm going to be uh, sharing some ideas that are, are found in a, a relatively new book uh, published by Reasons to Believe, which is the organization that I work for. And the book is entitled Thinking About Evolution. And in this book, we take a Q&A format where we uh, pose 25 questions that relate to the topic of evolution that are, in our experience are questions that really uh, get at the essence of kind of the creation evolution conversation, uh, but also at the same time represent questions that we typically hear Christians and ask or, or questions that would be of interest, particularly to a Christian audience. And so the emphasis in the book is uh, about is thinking about evolution. And, you know, when it comes to this particular topic, the, the creation evolution uh, conversation is, is a, is a well-worn topic and there's countless number of books dealing with issues related to evolution and, and evolution and creation. So, you know, why one other book, um, you know, and what would be the motivation to produce another book on this topic? And, you know, part of the, the motivation is recognizing that today uh, evangelical, uh, evangelicals and conservative Christians are very interested in the topic of evolution. And that interest has really shifted um, rather dramatically. When I first began working at Reasons to Believe, which was over 20 years ago, uh, there was a high level of interest in evolution among evangelicals and conservative Christians. But almost uniformly, uh, Christians uh, would express skepticism about at least aspects or facets of the evolutionary paradigm. Uh, but today, a growing number of, again, evangelical and conservative Christians are seriously entertaining the idea uh, of, of, in, uh, of evolution as a valid explanation for biological origins and are looking at how to uh, accommodate evolutionary theory within Christian theology. And this is in large measure due to, I think, the success of organizations like BioLogos, which is really an, an advocacy group for biological evolution within the, within the church, and other organizations that are emerging on the scene, like uh, Peaceful Science, which is uh, led by uh, my friend Josh Schwamadas. And people that are advocating for a position known as theistic evolution or evolutionary creation, where uh, God is seen as, in, as using evolution as the means to create, argue that the, the reason we must do this as evangelicals is because there's overwhelming evidence for common descent and hence biological evolution. And uh, the, this evidence is coming, according to these advocates, is coming to us from the science of genomics where we've been able to sequence the entire genetic makeup of human beings. And by examining our genome, uh, people argue that it's very clear that our genome has been shaped by evolutionary forces. But on top of that, our genome shares features with genomes of the great apes and other organisms. And the argument goes that these shared features reflect, again, a shared evolutionary history or reflect common descent. And so the argument goes that there's overwhelming evidence for biological evolution. And so in light of that, we really need to, as evangelicals, embrace evolution and, and again, look for ways to accommodate this idea within Christian theology. Uh, there are others who argue that uh, because biological evolution is the mainstream idea uh, in, in the life sciences with respect to the, to the question of origins, that if we are going to remain credible in our witness, particularly to scientifically minded people, then we have to embrace the ideas of science and acknowledge the ideas of science. And then again, look for ways to integrate those ideas into Christian theology. Otherwise we lose credibility as evangelicals. And then last but not least, the argument uh, goes that uh, the creation evolution controversy creates divides and by embracing evolution, a side benefit would be uh, 
that we no longer have to engage in these divisive arguments, but rather we can build bridges with our culture with the hope of, of sharing the gospel. And these are all, you know, really compelling arguments uh, that, you know, one could make for theistic evolution or evolutionary creation. And in my experience, most evangelicals who aren't really well versed in, in the life sciences will actually see the last two reasons as the, the, the most important reasons for entertaining or for considering, again, theistic evolution. Is there concern that if we don't embrace this idea, again, we're going to lose credibility and we're going, our witness will be harmed? And yet, in spite of these really good reasons, <laughs> I think for considering evolutionary creation, I'm not an evolutionary creationist. I hold to a position known as old earth creationism, or sometimes you might hear it called progressive creation. Uh, and, uh, and so what I want to do today is, is talk about the reasons why I'm not an evolutionary creationist, or at least talk about some of those reasons. But before I do that this evening, um, I'd like to spend a moment just looking at this, this question. Does theistic evolution or evolutionary creation make Christianity more credible to skeptics? Because again, this is perhaps the number one reason most people entertain theistic evolution or, or, or embrace theistic evolution. Again, particularly if they, they lack, again, a background, a strong background in the life sciences. And in my experience, uh, the answer to this question is no, that embracing theistic evolution or evolutionary creation really does very little in terms of the way skeptics perceive the Christian faith. It does very little in terms of, of creating credibility for the Christian uh, worldview or for the gospel itself. And just as, kind of, as, as proof of, of that, I'd like to show you a couple of blog entries that were written by uh, two individuals who are prominent atheists and also who are life scientists. Uh, and these blog articles were written very close to each other within a few days of each other. And they were written in response to some articles that were posted on the BioLogos website. And, and again, BioLogos is an organization originally founded by Francis Collins, who today is the head of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and, and he established BioLogos as a, an advocacy organization, again, to promote theistic evolution. And in the very early days of the organization's history, as the website was coming online and they were beginning to post articles staking out their position, there was a lot of interest in BioLogos and in the views that they held. And uh, after establishing uh, a case for human evolution uh, through articles and videos on their website, they address the issue of the historicity of Adam and Eve. And this is what these two uh, bloggers are responding to. One of them is P.Z. Myers. P.Z. Myers uh, is a biologist at the University of Minnesota Morris. And he is an outspoken atheist and he's also uh, he also has a, an award-winning blog called uh, Ferengula. And I actually debated P.Z. Myers on Darwin Day a number of years ago at, at the North Dakota State University. Talk about a great place to be in February, Fargo, North Dakota. But uh, this is what he writes. Uh, now I discover that Biologos is also carrying on about the historicity of Adam and Eve, with their usual load of waffle and metaphor and vague ways of trying to say it was really true and God made us really, really special anyway. There was no Adam, there was no Eve. We are the product of populations and pools of genes that are briefly instantiated in individuals. And it's a great conceptual error to even fuss over finding the many times great grandparents of us all. It's an even greater error to try to use poorly understood genetics to justify believing in a goofy myth created by people who hadn't even imagined genetics yet. Uh, another blog post comes from Jerry Coyne. Uh, Jerry Coyne is a well-known evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago. He, uh, again, is an outspoken atheist. 
has written a book called Why Evolution is True and also has a blog by that same title. And this is what he writes. This kind of desperate apologetics makes believers look pretty bad, at least to those of us who have any respect for truth. It's far simpler to just see Adam and Eve as metaphors since there's not a scintilla of evidence that they ever existed. But of course, if you start rejecting silly notions because there's no evidence for them, most of scripture goes down the drain. And so the reason for pointing out these two statements isn't to, 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 to attack or, or to criticize Biologos. It, I have a lot of friends that work at Biologos. I consider them to be not only friends, but brothers and sisters in Christ. They are you know, uh, uh, Christians that are absolutely sincere and deeply committed to their faith. But my point is this, and that is if you somehow think that embracing evolutionary creation is somehow going to elevate your credibility as a, as a Christian, when you engage skeptics, you need to think twice about that because uh, in my experience, it doesn't work that way. And I think you're better off, in my view, uh, trying to highlight deficiencies in evolutionary theory uh, as opposed to uh, trying to accommodate evolutionary theory within Christian theology if you're trying to reach skeptics. Because people like Jerry Coyne or P.Z. Myers are in, a, in effect of the view, and this is a common view, that if evolutionary mechanisms can explain the totality of biology, then a creator is superfluous. And they see essentially theistic evolutionists just tacking a creator onto evolutionary processes, which they argue in, a, if, uh, in and of themselves are sufficient to explain everything and a creator is simply unnecessary. So again, uh, it, just as a, 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 again, a, a point of, of, of strategy or I guess, or just a, a point of consideration is that um, thinking that theistic evolution is going to make the faith credible is not a good reason in my view to accept this idea. So then why am I not an evolutionary creationist? Well, there's a number of, of concerns that I have. And so this is not a straightforward answer <laughs> uh, by any means. Uh, to me, there are biblical and theological concerns that I have with evolutionary creation. There's some philosophical concerns, but I also have some legitimate scientific concerns as well. And that's what I'm gonna focus on this evening are uh, the scientific concerns that I have with, um, with theistic evolution or evolutionary creation. Uh, and the reason I'm going to focus on the scientific concerns is, is because so often I see people who, uh, uh, who are skeptical of, a, of an old earth creationist position who, who would take the view that the only reason why you are rejecting evolution, why you express any skepticism about evolution is ultimately for biblical reasons or philosophical reasons. And from my perspective, that's not the case. In fact, this is, the, this is not the case for the author team that worked together to produce the book, Thinking About Evolution. Our concerns are primarily scientific concerns. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, the reason I ultimately converted to Christianity was because of scientific concerns that I had uh, about chemical evolution and its capacity to explain uh, the origin of life. I was an, uh, an agnostic when I started graduate school. I embraced the evolutionary paradigm in, in, its, in, in its entirety. And yet studying uh, biochemistry and looking at the origin of life problem, I became convinced that, that biological systems at their basic foundational level, that is at the molecular level, are designed and that evolutionary mechanisms can't produce those systems. And that, that opened up the, the idea that, for me, there must be a mind that ultimately undergirds life itself. And I then asked the question, who is that mind? Who is that creator? And I found the answer to that question in the Christian faith and in the person of Christ. But, but my point here is this, is that my skepticism about the evolutionary paradigm, first and foremost, uh, is scientific. And it was scientific, uh, it, was, it was really scientific concerns uh, 
that even got me to question, the, again, the, the all-encompassing power of the evolutionary uh, paradigm. Now, to understand the basis for my scientific concerns, uh, I want us to spend just a couple of minutes um, uh, unpacking a, a very well-known statement now made by uh, the Russian geneticist Theodosius Dobzhensky, who, by the way, was a, a, a Russian Orthodox Christian. Uh, and Dobzhensky died a number of years ago, but he was a rather prominent uh, geneticist. Um, and in the 1970s, the early 1970s, he wrote an article for a journal called The American Biology Teacher. And in this article, Dobzhensky was uh, encouraging biology teachers to have a, a more prominent role for evolutionary theory in the science curriculum. And as part of that appeal, he wrote these words, which are maybe words that you've seen other, you've seen before, you've heard people say before, and that is that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And what Dobzhensky is getting at here is two, or, or is, you know, two things. The first is that evolutionary mechanisms are sufficient to explain everything that we see in biology. They can explain the origin and the design of life, the history of life, the diversity of life. Uh, and that secondly, that for a biologist, the theory of evolution is the organizing principle in the life sciences. Uh, that, that, the, that the theory of evolution is in effect on the same level as relativity and quantum mechanics for a physicist. That is, a physicist could not even begin to imagine considering the, the world around us, the physical world around us, apart from those two theories. They're the organizing framework for all of physics. And so likewise, the theory of evolution is the organizing framework for all of biology. That it's not so much that evolutionary biologists um, look to, to evaluate the theory of evolution on an ongoing basis, they accept it as a true idea and that it, now it becomes the framework by which everything in biology is interpreted. And so when you raise questions about whether or not aspects of the evolutionary paradigm are valid, what you're doing is you're challenging the very edifice of the life sciences and that creates enormous amount of resistance to, to any critique leveled against the evolutionary paradigm. But again, part of this commitment uh, in, uh, to, the, to evolution as an organizing principle is predicated on the idea that mechanisms alone can explain everything in biology. And this is the basis of, of the, my skepticism about at least aspects of the evolutionary paradigm, because in my experience, it's not true. It's not true that evolutionary mechanisms can explain everything in biology. As evolutionary theory is currently constructed, uh, we do not have explanations for key transitions in life's history, like the origin of life or the origin of eukaryotic cells, the origin of uh, body plans and animals, or the origin of human exceptionalism. And, and uh, this is rather significant because these are not just simply uh, important transitions in life's history, you could argue these are the, the key transitions in life's history because each transition represents life going from one regime of complexity to another. That each transition is, uh, represents biological innovation of such an extent that it actually establishes a whole new regime of, of life's history and a whole new regime of, of biological innovation. So for example, the transition from prokaryotic cells to eukaryotic cells is absolutely critical because eukaryotic cells have the complexity that you need to support the emergence of multicellular organisms. So if it wasn't for that transition, there would not be multicellular life on the planet, period. Uh, and so the, the, you know, uh, the th three of life's kingdom, most important kingdoms, fungi, plants, and animals are all exist because of this, this key transition in life's history or the transition from colonial aggregates of cells to true multicellular organisms. Again, uh, 
sets the stage for the emergence of body plans, which now makes uh, multicellular animal life possible. So anyway, these are key transitions in life's history that evolutionary theory lacks good, solid, uh, enduring explanations. What's also interesting is that, that these key transitions in life's history all happen explosively. They all happen abruptly in a geological instant without any kind of intermediary grades documenting these transitions. And the abruptness of these transitions is evident when you examine them in the fossil record, but also using techniques like uh, phylogenetics, uh, you can show that again, these transitions happen uh, abruptly, again, without intermediary grades. And in fact, Eugene Koonin has dubbed these transitions biology's big bangs because of the, the nature or the characteristics of, of these transitions where life suddenly goes from one regime of complexity to, to another, where there's this practically instantaneous innovation taking place in life's history. And again, the, these, these, these big bangs co coincide with those transitions that lack robust evolutionary explanations. So on this basis alone, I'm, I'm skeptical of, the, of evolution because it's not true that uh, evolution, uh, at least as it's conceived today, has this all sufficient explanatory power for the totality of biology. Now, there's another reason why I'm also skeptical about at least aspects of the evolutionary paradigm. And that is because of failed predictions. Uh, that, that the evolutionary paradigm makes predictions about the nature of the living realm. <clears throat> and, and there's a number of instances where we see failed predictions. Now, from a scientific perspective, this is significant because in science, you propose a, a theory and a hypothesis, a model, whatever you want to describe it, or however you want to describe it. <clears throat> and the way you evaluate ideas in science is through testing that these ideas have predictions that are logical consequences, logical entailments of, of the, the, the theory itself. And if those uh, predictions are satisfied by observation and experimental work, then you uh, believe or you, you conclude that the theory has, again, validity, that the theory is something that, again, um, has validity. If those predictions fail, you either have to revise the theory or it raises questions about whether or not the theory is complete or whether or not the theory is even valid. So failed scientific predictions are, are justification in my mind to question at least aspects again of, of the evolutionary paradigm. And one place where we see what I believe to be a failed prediction has to do with the phenomena known as convergence. Uh, and convergence uh, refer in an evolutionary context refers to the repeated independent origin of the same biological designs. In other words, if you, ha you have, from an evolutionary perspective, groups of organisms that are, form distinct groups that, that don't, these organisms would not naturally cluster or group together. And from an evolutionary perspective, they essentially have an independent evolutionary history. And yet in these organisms, we see the, the identical designs or nearly identical designs or identical or nearly identical biological features that appear to have arisen independently, uh, in, in, again, several distinct instances. And this is the phenomenon of convergence. And I'm going to argue in the next few minutes that we would expect convergence to be rare uh, but in fact, what we see is convergence is widespread uh, in the biological realm. Let me just spend just a few more minutes unpacking <clears throat> the idea of convergence and, and giving it some context. When we look at um, you know, organisms, uh, we note that organisms many times have shared biological features. And these shared features can be categorized into, into one or two groupings. One would say, or would uh, assign these shared features uh, to, 
uh, or explain these shared features as a result of a phenomena called homology, which are shared features that are found in organisms that would naturally group together. Uh, and that it, presumably these organisms have a shared evolutionary history where those shared features reflect that shared history. They reflect, in effect, common descent. Uh, an, another companion concept would be analogy. And then this is, again, which, what I just described. Organisms that have shared features, but these organisms don't naturally cluster together. And they, they have an independent evolutionary history. And so the idea here is that these, these features are, that are shared are viewed as being analogous features and must have had an independent evolutionary origin. Here's a, the quintessential example of a homologous biological structure. This would be the vertebrate forelimb. Uh, and if you look at the forelimb of any vertebrate, uh, it has the same design. It consists of a long bone in the upper arm called the humerus. There's a co of course a joint, the elbow. There are two bones, the radius and the ulna. Then there are the carpals, which are the wrist bones, the metacarpals, which are the hand bones. And then there are are five digits or phalanges. So this is a, called a pentadactyl architecture. Uh, and if you look at, for example, the flipper of a whale, the wing of a bat, uh, the, the, the hoof of a horse, the hand of a human, and the list goes on and on, these are all uh, forelimbs that have the same fundamental design. Now, these forelimbs superficially have different appearances, they perform different functions, but they again share the same biological design. And so the argument would be that the, the first uh, vertebrate on the land, a tetrapod, would have had that the, the same type of forelimb structure. And as this group of organisms gave rise to all these diverging evolutionary lineages, that feature was retained uh, and modified through descent with modification. Now, analogies can, are nicely illustrated in this diagram, which shows essentially a shark, an ichthyosaurus, and a porpoise. And uh, these, uh, uh, one is a, a fish, one is a, a reptile, and one is a mammal. And yet they all have the same uh, body form, and yet they have independent origins. Uh, uh, so here it looks as if in evolution independently hit upon the same biological design in three separate instances. So these would be analogous features or, um, or convergent features. This is a, another way of looking at the, these two uh, concepts where in the, on the left-hand side, we see an, an illustration of shared features that are homologous. And on the right, we see features that are shared that would be considered to be convergent features. So homologous features essentially are due to divergent evolution and uh, analogous features are due to convergent evolution. Now, <clears throat> as, I, as I mentioned, I think convergence is problematic for the evolutionary paradigm or at least the widespread uh, in, uh, in wide scale occurrences of uh, convergence. And the fact of the matter is, we, again, we wouldn't expect convergence to happen. Uh, interestingly enough, Darwin, uh, Charles Darwin in the sixth edition, I believe, of The Origin of Species writes about convergence. And he argues that you would expect it to be very rare, if occurring at all. This is what he writes. It is incredible that the descendants of two organisms which had originally differed in a marked manner should ever afterwards converge so closely as to lead to a near approach to identity throughout their whole organization. So what Darwin is, is arguing here is that you would not expect convergence to take place. Uh, and there's a reason why that, that's so. And it has to do with the very nature of the evolutionary process. Uh, because the way most evolutionary biologists conceive evolution is as a historically contingent process where you have essentially evolutionary pathways made up of a sequence of chance events. Uh, in other words, that 
when you look at the, an evolutionary pathway or a proposed evolutionary pathway, what it, it, it consists of is a history of mu uh, mutational changes to the genome that are then operated on by the forces of selection. And this is happening repeatedly from generation to generation to generation. And these genetic changes are in effect random. They're chance events. And what is meant by that is that these events are taking place in the genome independent of and without any regard to the needs of the organism or what is taking place in the environment. These are random events. And that the forces of selection that then are operating on those events are in effect random as well and very difficult to replicate. And so the idea is you have the sequence of chance events and the likelihood of those sequence of chance events occurring a second time or a third time by chance, again, is incredibly remote. It's highly improbable. Uh, and yet the sequence of chance events is significant because each chance e genetic change operated on by, again, the, the forces of selection at that point in time are going to set up a trajectory for subsequent evolutionary changes that are taking place. And so in other words, because of that, you would not expect evolution to repeat itself. Uh, it, it, sh it, it, should repeat its it should not repeat itself at all. This is how the late uh, Stephen Jay Gould, an evolutionary biologist, describes historical contingency in his book, Wonderful Life. No finale can be specified at the start. None would ever occur a second time in the same way because any pathway proceeds through thousands of improbable stages. Alter any early event ever so slightly and without apparent importance at the time and evolution cascades into radically uh, different channels. And, and the metaphor that Stephen Jay Gould developed was that of a, the tape of life, that if you could rewind the tape of life and let it play again, the outcome would be different time and time again because of the historically contingent nature of the evolutionary process. Uh, a, a few years ago, uh, a, a team of uh, researchers were uh, examining uh, the evolutionary process through computer simulations where they were creating this, uh, this uh, digital or virtual landscape in which these digital or virtual organisms lived in and they were able to evolve those organisms. And what they discovered is that by studying the evolutionary process in this way, that they concluded that uh, contingency is a, might be a general feature of evolution in systems with unbounded, nearly neutral variation. In other words, uh, they are through modeling studies demonstrating that evolution appears to be, again, historically contingent. And so this now allows us to evaluate the evolutionary paradigm. This leads to a key prediction. That is, historical contingency should characterize the living realm, or as a, a, a or conversely, we would expect that evolution should have rarely repeated itself. That the I, that the phenomenon of convergence should be relatively rare. And as I've mentioned, uh, we we see convergence as a widespread feature, and we've been able to detect the widespread occurrence of of convergence in recent years thanks to some advances in what are called phylogenetics. Uh, this is the area of evolutionary biology where people uh, are working to build evolutionary trees, which are hypotheses about what we believe to be the evolutionary relationships among a group of organisms. And uh, one way in which you can build evolutionary trees conceptually is by looking at shared features that you see uh, among organisms and many times organisms have shared features that allows you to group them or, uh, or to categorize them into the same group. And then many times groups of organisms can be further grouped into a larger group. And that process can be repeated until you build what's known as a, 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 a nested hierarchy where there are groups within groups within groups, which is what's illustrated in this diagram. And what you can do then is you can take this group within group arrangement and you can re-express it, you can express it as, a, as an evolutionary tree where you're assuming that organisms that group together 
have a shared evolutionary history. And two groups that again cluster together must have come from a, a, a shared, again, uh, evolutionary ancestor. And so the tips of this tree represent the groups uh, that we saw in that diagram and the, 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 the nodes in the tree represent the common ancestor that presumably gave rise to those uh, organisms that belong to these individual groups. Now, the way in which these evolutionary trees have been built traditionally is through the use of anatomical and physiological features. These are called morphological phylogenies. And in more recent years, thanks to the, uh, the advent of genomics and our ability to sequence genomes, most people are now using genetic data and similarities and differences in DNA sequences to construct evolutionary relationships. And these are uh, known as molecular phylogenies. And the expectation is that morphological and molecular phylogenies should agree with each other, right? That, that if indeed the, the evolutionary paradigm is true, molecular and morphological phylogenies should be in agreement. And what we are actually seeing now is that this is not the case. That, that through the use of molecular and morphological phylogenies, we're seeing that there, there is an incongruency in evolutionary histories depending upon the data set that you're using to build those evolutionary histories. But moreover, what we are seeing with molecular phylogenies are organisms that actually group together in ways that are distinct from what we would expect, again, based on their morphological features. And this has revealed a large number of examples of convergence. And so when we ask the question, does evolution repeat or does evolution have the appearance of repeating itself? The answer is yes, it does it, time and time and time again. And, and what I wanna do is just spend a few minutes giving you a, a couple of examples of, of what has been discovered uh, as examples of convergent evolution. And this is just to uh, help you uh, understand why this again is, is so problematic. So the first example that I want to talk about has to do with an order of mammals known as the chiropterans. These are the bats. Uh, and there are two, uh, within this order, there are two suborders, microchiroptera and megachiroptera. Uh, the microchiropterans are insectivores. These are bats that are capable of echolocation where they will locate their prey again through echolocation. Uh, the megachiropterans are fruit eating bats and they are characterized by having a high level of visual acuity. And it makes sense because if you're eating fruits, you wanna be able to detect them in trees. Uh, uh, and, and so visual acuity becomes really very important. And if you're of course an insectivore, being able to locate those insects through echolocation again, makes a lot of sense. Now, there's a group of, of bats called the rhinolophophidians. This is a, 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 um, a super family of bats. And traditionally, rhinolophophidians were clustered with the microchiropterans. Why? Because they were capable of echolocating. Using molecular genet uh, data to build phylogenies indicates that rhinolophophidia actually groups with the me me megachiropterans. That means that echolocation must have evolved independently two separate times in bats. There's not a singular origin for echolocation, but two independent origins within bats. And of course, we also note that echolocation is also origina originated independently in the cetaceans as well, the dolphins and the porpoises and, and the whales. And so this is remarkable when you think about the, 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 the sheer complexity of, of echolocation as a, as a sensory system. Uh, it's remarkable to think it would have evolved this one time, let alone two separate times. Now there's other problems that the use of molecular phylogenies have created for, uh, for those studying bat origins. And this is the grouping of Chiropter within a superorder known as Archonta. Archonta uh, is a superorder that traditionally consisted of bats, 
primates, uh, shrews, and sorry, or sorry, Scandentia and Dermopterid. Um, I'm, uh, Dermopterans are uh, flying lemurs. I'm drawing a blank on, on what Scandentia is. Sorry about that. Um, but these are these groups, this super order consists of orders that again group together because of shared, um, again, biological features like the ability for flight or the or the or visual acuity, things like that. Uh, and it turns out that using molecular data to build evolutionary trees indicates that Chiroptera isn't part of the super uh, order Archonta, but belongs in the super order Ferra ungulata. And this means that the flight structures in Dermoptera, which are the flying lemurs, and Chiroptera evolved twice. And that the visual systems in Megachiroptera and the primates, uh, which are again identical systems, must have evolved independently on two separate occasions. So again, this is, this is illustrating the types of problems that convergence causes in terms of, again, what you are expecting evolution to be able or to have, to have been able to accomplish. Another example of, of, of convergence has to do with the practice of fungus farming. This is a, a behavior seen in a number of insects. And um, uh, uh, fungus farming essentially involves a rather complex symbiotic relationship between insects and fungi, where actually insects will uh, cultivate uh, fungus gardens in their colonies, which provides an environment where the fungus can thrive, but then the fungus in turn provides food stuff for the colony. And uh, the, the fungus farm is established when a female leaves the colony to establish a new colony. As part of that process of leaving the colony to form a new colony, she will take with her a cultivar of the fungus and then will actually start a fungus garden uh, in, the, in, the, in the underground chambers that house the colony. And the, the, the members of the colony will actually use that fungus as a source of food, but they actively spend time uh, in, uh, pr you know, uh, providing uh, fertilizer and food stuff for the fungus so that the fungus can grow. They cultivate and weed and care for the fungus garden, again, because it serves as a, a source of food. So it's a, a, a very, again, elaborate, almost a remarkable symbiotic relationship. Well, it turns out that fungus farming appears to have evolved independently in ants, termites, and in beetles seven times, and in snails. And so this, again, is remarkable to think that this sophisticated and complex symbiotic relationship could emerge a single time, let alone multiple times independently. Uh, another uh, remarkable example of convergence has to do with the visual system of the chameleon and the sand lance, where the chameleon is, a, of course, a reptile and the sand lance is a fish. Now, the reason why this example of convergence is is, is so significant is has to do not only with the complexity of the system that presumably emerged independently two separate times, but with the fact that these organisms live in two separate types of environments, aquatic and terrestrial environments. And the reason why this is significant is because many evolutionary biologists will argue that the way to explain convergence is that even though these organisms have independent evolutionary histories, because they were confronted with the same types of selective forces, that evolution forced uh, the, the same or for, was uh, forced the same or the nearly same outcome, evolutionary outcome. But if you have organisms that live in a, an aquatic and a terrestrial environment, these are very different selective environments. The selective pressures in these environments are very different. And so you can't argue that convergence funneled evolution down the same pathway. Now, the chameleon is, a, again, a, a reptile, and the sand lance is a fish that will bury itself in the sea floor, and then its eyes will stick out of the sea floor, and it'll look for prey that are 
that are swimming by and then will uh, exit the seafloor and attack, uh, attack that prey. And they both have essentially eyes that move independently of one another, where one eye is motionless and the other eye is moving around. These uh, eye visual systems in both the chameleon and the sand lance vary the, the, the shape of the, the cornea to focus the image on the retina as opposed to using a lens. And that means that it requires specialized muscles to control the shape of the cornea. And so these organisms have identical muscular systems associated with the cornea. And the, the depth perception is determined by holding, again, one eye fixed and then by rastering the other eye back and forth very rapidly. And that allows the organisms to, again, perceive depth. And when the chameleon attacks prey, when the sand lance attacks prey, that, that attack trajectory is dictated uh, by a coordinated uh, interaction with the visual system, and it's an identical attack trajectory. So this is, a, again, an, a remarkable example of convergence that's happening in very different environments. Uh, the researchers that discovered this said when faced with a beautifully coordinated optical system such as this, it is a challenge to provide an explanation for the convergence of so many different finely tuned mechanisms. Now, uh, we also see convergence not only at the anatomical and physiological level, we even see convergence at the biochemical level as well. Uh, and there's different types of, of biochemical convergences, and I'm not going to detail them at this point. It's, uh, it's uh, essentially, a de these are details that are unnecessary. But it's not only do we see convergence in individual uh, biomolecules, we actually see convergence in, in, in total biochemical systems. And the most extreme example of this would be DNA replication. It looks as if the, the mechanism for DNA and the process for DNA replication evolved two separate times in new bacteria and archaea. Uh, and, and this is absolutely to me as a biochemist, absolutely mind boggling to think that somebody could propose something like this happening. Uh, when we think about the, the sheer complexity uh, of, by, of, of DNA replication. And what I wanna do in the next couple of minutes is just give you a very quick overview of how DNA replication works. And the point here is for you to essentially appreciate the, the complexity of, of DNA replication. Uh, because again, what we're saying is that this system evolved independently on two separate occasions in uh, new bacteria and archaea, which are the two major, two of the major uh, domains of life. And to understand how DNA replication works, we need to understand a little bit about the structure of DNA. So here's a a diagram showing a small portion of the DNA double helix. And DNA consists of two molecular strands that align in a, in a, a, a parallel manner where the, the molecular strands are built by linking together smaller subunit molecules in a head to tail fashion. And those smaller molecules are, are referred to as the genetic letters and abbreviated A, G, C, and T, adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. And if you think about DNA as being, uh, its architecture being similar to a ladder, the backbones of these two strands are like the uprights of a ladder. And then the side groups that interact between the two strands form the rungs of the ladder. And then if you take that ladder and twist it in a right-handed manner, you get this DNA double helix. Now it turns out that the, 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 um, the, the sequence of one strand is complementary to the sequence of another strand. And that complementarity is established by essentially what are known as base pair interactions, uh, where adenine on one strand always pairs with thymine on the other, guanine on one strand always pairs with cytosine on the other. And so that way, if you know the nucleotide sequence or the sequence of genetic letters on one strand, 
you're going to know what the sequences are on the other strand because of those complementary base pairing rules. And this is critical for uh, how DNA replication takes place. Because conceptually, what happens is you have a DNA double helix that separates where the two strands separate. And then the biochemical machinery can read the nucleotide sequence on each of those individual strands and through the base pairing rules, assemble a, 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 a complementary strand. Uh, and so now you have DNA replication that is taking place where each molecule has one strand from the original parent and one strand that's been newly synthesized. And so this is referred to as template directed uh, semi-conservative uh, replication. And it, DNA replication doesn't have to occur this way. When people are trying to understand how DNA replication occurs, this was one of three possible options for how DNA replication could occur. Uh, so again, it, it's template-directed semi-conservative replication. Now, <clears throat> DNA replication uh, takes place, again, uh, where you could conceptually conceive of the two strands uh, separating from one another, exposing single strands of DNA that then serve as templates to assemble the new daughter strand. But in the DNA molecule inside the cell, this process of replication begins at a place called the origin of replication. And when that happens, you get part of the DNA double helix to unwind. This creates a bubble, what appears to be a bubble, that then is the site of replication. And that bubble progresses outward in two directions. So you have DNA replication happening at two, the two ends of the bubble. And that point of replication where the, 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 the double helix is opening up is called the, the replication fork. So there are two forks of replication. Now, it turns out that even though the strands of DNA are parallel, in fact, they actually are uh, anti-parallel, meaning that there is an orientation to the DNA strands that, that is referred to as five prime, three prime, or three prime, five prime. And so in the DNA double helix, the strands are actually oriented in an anti-parallel fashion where you have one strand, five prime, three prime, the other uh, three prime, five prime. So uh, uh, they're, they're, one's upside down compared to the other. Now this has profound implications for the process of DNA replication because DNA replication can only proceed in a single direction. It only can go in the five prime to three prime direction, which means that when you unravel the, the double helix and you have now this replication fork, one of the strands is in the right orientation to allow for DNA replication, the other strand isn't. So the strand that's in the right orientation DNA replication can proceed and it proceeds rapidly and it proceeds in an uninterrupted fashion. This is called the leading strand uh, or the continuous strand. Now the other strand uh, has a really bizarre mode of replication because again, the strand is in the wrong orientation, but once replication is proceeded uh, to, to a certain degree and the replication bubble becomes big enough enough of this, the single strand is exposed that now replication can proceed in the opposite direction of the leading strand. But it can only proceed in spurts where a small portion of DNA is replicated. You have to wait for more of the bubble to open up. Then another small piece of DNA is replicated. This is called the discontinuous strand or the lagging strand. And it all has to do with the five prime, three prime uh, orientation of, of DNA and the dir strict directionality of DNA replication. There's a whole host of enzymes that are working on DNA during the replication process. There is an enzyme called a helicase that unwinds the DNA. There are these single-stranded binding proteins that bind to the single-stranded DNA, stabilizing it. Uh, it turns out that the enzyme that replicates DNA, uh, it's a DNA polymerase, cannot start uh, um, on its own. It has to have a small piece of RNA uh, laid down in order for that enzyme to operate. And that small piece of RNA is called an RNA primer. 
and it's laid down by this massive protein complex called a primosome. But once that RNA primer is laid down, uh, the DNA polymerase can take over and start the replication process. Now on the discontinuous strand, every time the replication process starts, you have to lay down an RNA primer followed by, again, uh, by the, again, the, the DNA polymerase. Once that process is all completed, there is an enzyme that comes along and removes the RNA sequences. And then another enzyme comes along and fills in those removed RNA with, again, DNA, with DNA, pieces of DNA. And then there's an enzyme called a ligase that seals all the discontinuous fra uh, fragments together. And so this is, again, how DNA replication takes place. This is just a very quick overview. And I know that I tortured you for you know, quite a few minutes with that explanation. But the point I was trying to make here is the complexity of the process. And to think that this process emerged a single time uh, is remarkable but to th through evolutionary processes, but to consider that it originated two separate times, but yet wound up being identical in terms of its mechanism, in terms of its, its operation is mind boggling. Uh, Bill Schaff, uh, one of the world's leading origin of life researchers said, because biochemical systems comprise many intricately interlinked pieces, any particularly full blown system can only arise once. Since any complete biochemical system is far too elaborate to evolve more than once uh, in the history of life, it's safe to assume that the primal last common ancestral cell line had the same traits that characterize all its present day descendants. In other words, what B Bill Schaff is arguing here is this, that in, in according to evolutionary theory, there was an organism called the last common ancestor that anchors the evolutionary tree of life. And that this organism uh, would then have given rise to two separate branches the eubacteria and the archaea. And Bill Schaff is arguing that these systems are so complex that you would expect that they would have arisen in, in LUCA and then have been retained in, in all other cells that evolved from this last common ancestor. But when it comes to DNA replication, this isn't the case. That when it comes to DNA replication, uh, it, it, it looks as if, again, DNA replication emerged independently in archaea and in eukarya and eubacteria uh, after they, these lineages diverged from the last common ancestor, and that these systems are identical in terms of their makeup. And that again is remarkable. So, in other words, uh, for me, again, when I when I look at um, the evolutionary paradigm and Think about the evolutionary paradigm as a scientist from a scientific perspective and ask, well, what kind of predictions does this paradigm make? I see that there are predictions that essentially have uh, represent failed predictions. And to me, convergence is one of the most prominent examples of a failed prediction. And so I would argue that on the, this basis, as well as by virtue of the fact that evolution can't account for key transitions in life's history, that I am uh, justified as an old earth creationist I expressing skepticism or doubt about the grand claim of evolution that everything in biology can be explained uh, through evolutionary mechanisms, because I don't think that's the case whatsoever. Now, it's all well and good to, to take pot shots at at a, at a scientific theory and, and highlight the deficiencies in that theory. But if you're going to hold to a position like uh, old earth creationism or progressive creationism, then it's also important to be able to make a positive case uh, for, for your perspective. And I think convergence not only represents a, a challenge to the evolutionary paradigm, I think it also provides us an opportunity to make a case for design. Uh, because uh, the idea of, or, of, of, of organisms having shared designs, uh, and here I'm referring to organisms that wouldn't naturally group together, but organisms having uh, shared designs uh, 
is something that you would expect uh, from a design perspective. It's not unusual for designers to utilize the same designs over and over again. And so when we see convergence that's widespread, one way to explain this is that there is a, a mind that conceived of those designs and introduced these, these same designs uh, in organisms that would again, uh, not naturally cluster or group together. And that this is actually a very efficient way to develop technologies is to use the, the same technology, the same design uh, in, in different contexts to, to solve the same problem confronted uh, in, uh, by you know, the, the engineers or the designers in different contexts. And so you could see the widespread occurrences of convergence is not independent evolutionary origins, but actually independent uh, creation events, if you will, uh, where a creator is bringing about the same designs, again, in unrelated organisms. Okay, and, and again, if you um, want to dig deeper into this, into the questions relating to uh, evolution, uh, I would again invite you to consider taking a look at the book, Thinking About Evolution. Uh, so the, many of the topics we talked about tonight are, are addressed in this book. In fact, there's a whole chapter about convergence in the book, Thinking About Evolution. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop the, the screen share and uh, turn the floor over to you guys for, um, uh, turn the, the floor over to you guys to ask questions or uh, to engage in, in conversation. All right, so if anybody has a question, go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question. Hello, good evening, Dr. Fuzz. Uh, before I ask my question, I wanna thank you for giving your time for us. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the evolutionist's view about how life began in the first place, um, because I, I did a little bit of research. Uh, they seem to like misconstrue like speciation and adaptation as the mechanisms for macroevolution itself, right? But like, uh, as far as I know, the only observed uh, phenomenon in this world is a gradual loss of information, uh, not a gain of information from a lesser life form. All of a sudden, uh, creating new information out of itself with information it doesn't already have. So um, how do evolutionists uh, solve this supposed problem? Like, is there really a mechanism observed to actually allow for any of these things in the first place? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the, 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 the primary mechanism available uh, for evolutionary change would be, again, uh, genetic variation that arises through mutational events that then is operated on by selection. Uh, and that selection can be natural selection or it can be sexual selection. And you also see a phenomenon known as genetic drift as well, where you can introduce um, variation in trait frequencies and trait combinations in a, in a population through again, uh, a mechanism known as genetic drift. So these are the, the mechanisms that are available. And in my view, these mechanisms do a beautiful job of explaining uh, you, what, what, what you might call microevolution, the variation you see within a species. I think they do a great job of explaining um, speciation and, and things like that. Uh, but I, I don't know that these mechanisms can truly account for uh, the generation of biological novelty or can account for the generation of, of biological uh, innovation. This is really one of those outstanding questions right now in evolutionary theory is how do you explain, again, the emergence of novelty through these mechanisms? And, uh, and so, for example, when you're looking at uh, the, the way in which people conceive of the emergence of eukaryotic cells from prokary prokaryotic cells. The, the model is uh, that's being proposed is endosymbiogenesis, which is not relying on these, these mechanisms. It's a very different set of mechanisms uh, 
that people have to appeal to. Or when we talk about the origin of body plans, again, it's people question if these mechanisms can actually account for, um, again, the, 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 the types of changes that you would need to go from a colonial aggregate of cells to a, you know, a, 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 a multicellular organism that has organ systems that are integrated where you not only have to account for that, that final design, but you have to account for the, the, the embryonic uh, developmental process where you go from a, a single celled organism into a multicellular organism where again, through that developmental process, the different organ systems emerge and become integrated with each other. And so these, this is really where I think evolutionary theory breaks down. Now, it, it, it's a common argument that I hear from Christian apologists that evolutionary mechanisms can't generate information. And uh, I just simply don't think that's a, a valid argument. Um, I, I think that um, it, it, it becomes a complex discussion, but it depends upon what you mean by information, number one. And, uh, and many times when people make that assertion, they actually are not doing a very good job of defining information. It's a, they're talking about information in a very nebulous way, as opposed to a highly specific way that you need to in order to make that assertion. And I think there's clearly demonstrable cases where evolutionary mechanisms can generate new information. I, don't, I just simply don't think that's, that's a true statement. Now, so to me, the question isn't, can evolution generate, you know, evolutionary mechanisms generate information, but can they account for biological novelty? And when we talk about novelty, you're primarily looking at, can evolutionary mechanisms explain the emergence of, of new type, new biochemical systems? Can they explain at an organismal level, the, the emergence of, you know, new types of phenotypic properties? or you know, phenotypic systems. That, that I think is where um, the, the, the real question lies. And, and, and it's not just simply you know, people that are you know, skeptics about at least facets of the evolutionary paradigm that are bringing up this point. You see this question raised by evolutionary biologists themselves. In fact, there's something known as the extended evolutionary synthesis uh, that is being proposed by a number of evolutionary biologists as a, 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 an argument that current evolutionary theory is incomplete and that if we're going to account for these key transitions in life's history and, and account for novelty, that we have to actually uh, expand evolutionary theory because it, as it's currently conceived, it's not capable of, of accounting for these things. So anyway, that's, you know, that's the way I think about it. Uh, hopefully that, that helps so much thank you so much dr fuzz yeah yeah thanks for the question great question <clears throat> hi thank you so much for coming and talking with us tonight um i had a question that maybe was answered in the first uh half hour of your talk which i had to miss but i was wondering what you would say about vestigial um parts of the body in animals. I know with humans, people often think of the appendix, wisdom teeth. Right. Um, some people would say the whale's pelvis is vestigial, things like that. Yeah, that, that's, a, uh, that's a great question. And I didn't address that question uh, in the talk. So, and, and the, you know, the, the idea here, of course, is that vestigial structures are would be considered to be homologous structures, right? Where the idea is that these structures were found in an ancestral organism and they served some kind of functional role. And that as you know, evolutionary lineages diverged from that ancestral species because of the, the nature of the selective environment that the organism found itself in, that particular structural feature uh, performed a function that was no longer necessary for the organism to survive. And so that structure underwent some type of atrophy, you know, over, over time uh, to produce a, a non-functional feature uh, 
that is still retained in the organism's anatomy uh, uh, as a vestige of, of its evolutionary history. And, you know, it, uh, it, the couple of ways to, to think about that. One is oftentimes what we think to be vestigial structures actually turn out to be functional. And so, uh, and so if that's the case, then if you're viewing life through the lens of a creation model or an intelligent design perspective, you would, would argue that if these systems are functional, then uh, you, you can't necessarily argue that they're vestigial, right? That, that, it, that they, these are systems that, again, uh, because they're performing a function are compatible with a, a creation model or a design perspective. And so, you know, for example, the, the append, human appendix actually isn't vestigial at all. It actually is performing um, a, a function uh, per, uh, uh, providing um, uh, a storehouse of bacteria that helps to repopulate the intestinal tract uh, to maintain the, the gut uh, microbiome, as an example. You know, or, and so you, in every instance of so-called vestigial structures, you can actually point to fu uh, functional re reasons why those structures are still there or functional roles that those structures still play. Uh, I get to see an example of the vestigial structure that is truly vestigial, even with regard to the whale's pelvis. Now, another way to, to think about vestigial structures uh, relates to how somebody like me, who's a, an old earth creationist would view shared biological features. And I kind of alluded to that a little bit um, at the end of my talk, where you know, I look at shared designs as reflecting, again, or shared biological features as reflecting shared designs, that these are the same designs that are being redeployed in, in, in different organisms to accomplish uh, similar types of functions. But when it comes to homologous structures, uh, one way to think about those is that those homologous structures reflect an archetype, an archetypical design that is then uh, varied in, in organisms that belong to the same group. And it, it's interesting that prior to Darwin, uh, biologists were well aware of homologies, of homologous structures. In fact, uh, Sir Richard Owen, who's considered the father of comparative anatomy, uh, prior to Darwin's time, played a key role in elaborating the concept of homology. And the way that he interpreted homologies were that these were, again, archetypical designs that existed in the mind of the first cause that then uh, manifested those designs within the created order, uh, varying those designs to create a wide range of, of functional features and organisms, but yet they all retain the same design. And so when we look at things like the vertebrate forelimb, you know, which is a homologous structure, uh, you could argue that it's, it's essentially an archetype that then is varied in, in the different vertebrates to accomplish different you know, functions. And so now when it comes to vestigial structures, um, people uh, like Sir Richard Owen argue that vestigial structures uh, must be present because to remove those vestigial structures would be to violate the form, would be to violate the archetype. And so, you know, he, he, would, have, he would have argued that, yeah, the whale does have a pel pelvis, but because the whale is a, a mammal and, and it, it and it's built to, to conform to uh, the vertebrate archetype, uh, it has to have that, that pelvis there. If it, the pelvis wasn't there, even if it would, lacked function, it would be a violation of the archetype. And, and so this it would be a very similar concept to uh, an architect designing a building according to some kind of archetype, some kind of form, and incorporating features that don't perform any kind of actual function, but those features are incorporated because they're an integral part of the design element of the building. And so that would be essentially Owen's argument and, and people 
who, who, hold, who held to that position. So vestigial structures were recognized well before Darwin's time. It wasn't something that, uh, you know, that evolutionary biologists, you know, predicted based on evolutionary theory and then discovered. These were structures that were already recognized, uh, you know, prior to Darwin. So that's, that's the way I would think about vestigial structures is that they're either, either they're not truly vestigial in that they are functional and, and therefore they're, you know, could be understood as, as part of the organism's design or that they are part of the archetype. And again, still part of the organism's design, even if they're not functional. That makes sense, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, hi. Hey. Um, so thank you so much for this talk. It was very lovely. And I was distracted by homework, as I mentioned before, for part of it. But I finished the homework. And I heard most of the last part on convergence. But I may have been distracted. So forgive me if I bring up something that you did, in fact, cover. Um, and I have a couple of questions, but I'll just stick with one for now and let other people talk, too. Um, so when we're talking about features like you know whales and ichthyosaurs and all of that have the same sort of body structure or like birds and bats having wings things like that i mean my understanding of how those who who you know um who believe that okay i'll just say evolutionist i'm not sure how i feel about the word evolutionist but evolutionists would would say something like, well, you, your fitness, you know, you have fitness functions. This is a very abstract way of looking at it, right? But they have some, there's some sort of fitness terrain and there are gonna be attractors within that terrain. You can think of that as particularly advantageous body structures because of the laws of aerodynamics or hydrodynamics or, or whatever else. Um, and so naturally, even though these are contingent processes, meaning they, you know, you might start at different points in the terrain, you're gonna slide in, directions that, that end up converging. Um, and I'm not sure if you really addressed that, that um, but I'm interested in hearing, hearing your thoughts about, at least that's obviously a much more high level ex explanation than some of the very specific examples you gave, but. Right. Um, yeah, and, and, and first of all, I share your ambivalence with the term evolutionist, <laughs> right? You know, uh, I, I like to say people that view life through an evolutionary lens or, evolutionary biologist or whatever, but um, it, yeah, I mean, you, you know, the, the, I, um, I, I briefly alluded to, um, you know, to, to the process that you're describing, but I didn't, you know, elaborate it as it, it, it's in the same deep way, detailed way as you did. Uh, I mean, the way I've seen it described is that it's a similar to the idea of a fitness landscape where you have attractors, it would be you know, not selection is, is the forces of selection are similar enough that they're funneling, you know, evolution down the same pathway, right? So it, it'd be a, a different type of metaphor, but it's essentially the same concept. And, and I think that's actually not unreasonable when you talk about like the, the same form that you see for a porpoise and an ichthyosaurus and a, and a shark, because it's clear that they are in the same selective and experiencing the same selective pressures. And I just was using that as an example of convergence, not so much as part of my argument. But when you talk about something like echolocation, mm -hmm. right, where you're, you're dealing with a very sophisticated, you know, anatomical and physiological system that, uh, you know, th th that, that, that there could be easily you could easily conceive of different strategies that that you know bats could have could have come up with or that evolution could have produced to make bats efficient right and so and it's one thing to say okay echolocation emerges in bats as a single time but then to think that it's emerging two times independently in bats is really remarkable and that it also emerges in cetaceans and i didn't get get into these details but the the changes in the genome that support uh, echolocation 
in bats and cetaceans are identical, are identical genetic changes. Mm -hmm. And that's remarkable too, because you'd expect that if it was truly evolutionary convergence, that it ought to be distinct genetic changes that are supporting those, those systems, if indeed it is converging, right? Through the mechanism that you described, or uh, you know, or if you talk about um, um, you know the 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 visual system in the sand lance and in the chameleon, you know, where you are in, in an aquatic and a terrestrial environment, you know, and that that again is 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 rather remarkable that you would see that that kind of a, an unusual visual assist system emerging on two separate occasions. And so I don't know that, that that idea of a fitness landscape or a tractor actually is as compelling in those circumstances. Um, the only, the, the uh, or, you know, when you start talking about convergence at a molecular level, particularly when you talk about, you know, DNA replication and the fact that it's, you know, uh, semi-conservative template directed and that it's, that both, DNA replication systems are making use of primers, <laughs> you know, RNA primers and, and you know, leading stand, strand, lagging strand replication. That's amazing to think that, that those systems would have emerged independently. And again, I don't know that that attractor model it, it accounts for that, those kind of examples of convergence. Now, now the, um, the, the, um, the, there, there are um, evolutionary biologists who challenge the notion of historical contingency. In my experience, and I'm, I'm a biochemist, I'm not an, an evolutionary biologist by training. In my experience, most life scientists and most evolutionary biologists would view evolution as historically contingent. Um, there are biologists, because of the widespread convergence that they see that argue that evolution isn't historically contingent, but it, there's actually something within nature that's driving uh, evolution to the same endpoints. And uh, one of these people is Simon Conway Morris, who has a, a great book called uh, Life Solution. It's uh, probably about 15 years old now, but it's still worth reading. But Simon Conway Morris argues that there are these, constra these constraints that arise out of the laws of nature that only permit certain biological, fun biological structures and, and that, the, that evolution is going to then therefore hit upon those structures time and time and time again. And so he, you might say that he's thinking that what he's suggesting is like the attractor model that you're talking about, but it may not be, but I think it's, it, there's some significant or subtle differences in that it's not these evolutionary attractors, but they're these literally physical constraints. So in other words, if there's like 32 body plans that we see, you know, represented by approximately 30, 30 phyla, right? Uh, that these body plans are the only ways you can have multicellularity because of physical constraints. Therefore, evolution is going to have to take you there no matter what, because that's the only place you can go. These are the only places you can go, right? And, and, so, and so Simon Conway Morse sees a type of anthropic principle in, in evolution where he's, he's uh, arguing that that it's really eerie to think that there are these physical constraints that are forcing evolution to the same endpoint time and time again, and that these are exactly the types of systems that you would need for organisms to survive, right? Because you could envision physical constraints that would produce structures that are completely useless to organisms. And so he sees these anthropic coincidences and hence like a type of anthropic principle in biology. But now this is very much a teleological expression of evolution. Historical contingency is anti-teleological, whereas what Conway Morris is arguing for really su is suggesting a purpose to, to evolution. And in fact, this view is sometimes called structuralism. 
Mm-hmm. And so in a sense, when it comes to convergence, <clears throat> It, 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 it basically challenges the idea that evolution is historically contingent, right? Or uh, it, 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 you know, as an old earth, crea- Simon Conway Morse isn't truly a theistic evolutionist, but he's, he's clearly holds to evolutionary biology, but he sees a, a deep seated teleology to it, which separates him from most evolutionary biologists. And so either you're seeing this as, as evolution has you know, this, there's an anthropic principle that guides evolutionary outcomes, or you, you see the incompatibility between historical contingency and convergence as suggesting that there was <clears throat> a mind that intervened in a direct way to bring about creative purposes. Either way, your convergence is forcing you into a teleological arena where it, it you know, it, it's not uh, an unguided, historically contingent process, but there there is a an intentionality to what we see in biology. How that intentionality is arrived at uh, is what evolutionary creation or what what structuralists and old earth creationists would would dis, would disagree upon. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that was that was a lot. Thank you. Um, if I could follow up on one thing you said fairly early on now. Um, in the response about echolocation. So I could imagine just sitting in in my armchair and spitballing. I could imagine explanations for why two different families of bats, is it? Both Mm -hmm. developed echolocation after they diverged from their common ancestor, involving something, you know, for particular features of that common ancestor, which we may or may not even have extant specimens of, um, such that, you know, if it wasn't, if they weren't already echolocating, perhaps because they had particular auditory systems or particular vocal systems somewhat already in place that they shared commonly, that they would then, you know, that that would, would then would then basically mean that you know the attractor is in the direction of echolocation for both of them. Um, and I don't know enough about this particular, you know, this particular example to know, but does that sound plausible at all to you? Uh, I mean, that's how an evolutionary biologist would, would argue, or that there were developmental constraints or, yeah. or something like that. But again, to me, uh, it, it's, 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 again, it's, it's remarkable to think that, you know, um, that something like that would uh, uh, independently evolve to the point where, based on morphology, you would categorize rhinolophophidia very differently, uh, apart from having the, the the molecular phylogenies, you know. So you know. So to me, it's it's not that they again echolocate, but that the systems are so are indistinguishable that you would view them as as having a, a single evolutionary origin. And again, it's not just. I mean, I didn't bring this up, but it's not just limited to bats. You also have echolocation emerging right. mutations and. And again, it's the fact that the genetic changes are, you know, that support that are identical, you know, or, you know, involving the same set of genes. And it's a, a fairly large number of genes. That, that to me is, it, 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 at least it gives you some pause for, for thought. Yeah. I mean, and when you read the, the, the papers, you know, you, you see the researchers, you know, expressing amazement or surprise of what they're seeing. Right, this is you know, not expected. This is remarkable. I mean, these are key words that indicate that. Wait a minute, this isn't what we would have expected going in into this. And it'd be one thing if all we had was echolocation as the example, right? But I mean, if you read you know Conway Morris's book Life Solution, I mean, it's just chapter after chapter after chapter detailing the widespread convergence in biology. And in, in my book, The Cell's Design, I talk about molecular convergence. And I, I have a table where I list 100 examples of, of, bio, of biochemical convergence. And, and I, just, I just did 100 because that was a, a convenient number. <clears throat> you know, and, and so that to me is, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, there's something going on, right? When you're seeing convergence at that scale.
Well, thank you. Thank you. I've taken up a lot of time. So I do have a, a, a question less related to the talk, um, but I will sure. let other people chime in with other questions. Oh, go ahead, Paul. I see your hand raised. Hi there, Dr. Rana. I'm sorry I missed the first hour. I, I usually come at eight o'clock. I, I, I first have to say I know nothing about DNA and, and conversion, but I did, I, I've Decades ago, I dabbled in evolution in Sunday school, sort of, you know, learning about I was interested in apologetics. I, I teach law courses. So again, I, I know very little about this, you know, uh, the, the subject matter, but I, I, I am interested in, in matters of logic. And I was wondering if you could clarify this for me. So, you know, from what I remember reading about, you know, the, the, the problems with evolutionary theory, um, I remember right now it's, 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 people aren't so much into creationism, but about uh, intelligent design. And so here's the, the question I have. I mean, it seemed to me that um, in some, uh, when some evolutionary uh, uh, scientists try to create an experiment to show how it's possible that maybe life formed, you know, by, by I, I don't know if the phrase is correct, you know, random chance or just, you know, without design, that from the get-go seems to be just, uh, it, it's a dead end, why? Because you can't design an experiment to show that lack of design led to something. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not saying that that's the only evidence that evolutionists um, would use, but it seems that at least um, it doesn't make any sense to develop an experiment, to design an experiment, to show that life can happen apart from design when the experiment itself is designed. I, so I was wondering, is, 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 that, is that logic correct? Or I, just about that, I guess I'm trying to bring it, yeah. bring this discussion to a level that maybe I could, I could take something away and think, okay, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I've written a book um, called Creating Life in the Lab, where that's essentially the, the argument. And I, I focus primarily on um, the origin of life question and, and chemical evolution. And, and I talk about not only work in prebiotic chemistry where scientists are trying to recapitulate the different steps they think led up to the origin of life, but I also talk about work in synthetic biology where scientists are trying to create protocells that are these chemical super systems that assume the properties of life. And what becomes evident when you look at these studies is how intimately involved the researchers have to be in terms of the outcome of the experiment. Because, I mean, it's one thing if you're doing a, a prebiotic simulation reaction, let's say, to, to, to design the experiment and to, and to let it run. I mean, by definition, you, you have to do that. So you can't really penalize origin of life researchers for setting up the experiment and running it, right? Mm -hmm. But what's becoming, what becomes evident is that They've not, they just merely have not set up the experiment and let it run, but they actually have intervened to such an extent that they have jimmy rigged the system to ensure a successful outcome. And th this is uh, the, called a, the problem of unwarranted researcher involvement. In fact, original life researchers are now acknowledging this as a problem. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, this, of course, you know, I think undermines the notion of, of, a, of a chemical evolutionary process on Earth because it raises questions about is, what, is the work done in the lab even relevant to the conditions of the Earth? But you could also use that as a way to make an argument for intelligent design, right? Because it, it, instead of saying, well, you know, life must be designed because evolution can't do it or you know, life must be designed because it looks like it's designed. You're really arguing, well, life appears to be designed because empirically we have thousands and thousands of experiments in which it's clear that researcher involvement is critical to the outcome. And, and if that's the case in the laboratory, then why wouldn't that be the case you know, uh, on, you know, on the early earth? Why do, would you think now on the early earth, somehow uh, unguided processes under uncontrolled conditions are going to, to lead to productive outcomes? So I think that it's a, to me, I think it's a, a good argument, right? I think, but you have to present it in a, in a, in a nuanced way, right? Because you can't, 
penalize people for doing experiments, right? Uh, and by definition, you've got to, to, you know, to design and execute the experiment. But the, the question becomes, at what point does that researcher's involvement in that experimental design cross a, a, a line where they now have in, incorporated themselves into the experimental design? And where that line actually exists, uh, it can be debated, right? But Thank you very much. I appreciate that, especially the point where you said this, that's a, the sort of the, um, it's different from the argument, which I have heard before. They said, oh, well, it looks designed, therefore it must be designed, which it's circular. It doesn't, that doesn't, right, that, that's a lousy argument. But yeah. I, I see how it, the one that you present is different, right? There's empirically, it, it, it seems to match, this seems to match this. Yeah. Therefore, yeah, it's a, it is a little bit different. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Hello. I was wondering um, why you would call yourself an old earth creationist and what problems you would have with the young earth creation model. Yeah, well, um, I, I call myself an old earth creationist uh, uh, because I uh, am persuaded that the scientific measurements for uh, the you know, antiquity of the earth and the antiquity of life on earth are, are sound. And so I don't dispute you know, the, the measured ages of the earth and the major, measured ages of the universe. And so, you know, that that's why I would call myself an old earth creationist. Um, the, the way I view Genesis one is that day corresponds to a period of time as opposed to 24 hours. So like a, a young earth creationist, I would view Genesis one as a historical description <coughs> of God's creative work. I would just argue that day is a period of time as opposed to 24 hours. But uh, as a creationist, uh, I believe that uh, God um, intervenes in a, in a direct personal way to bring about his creative purposes uh, that, you know, I would e express skepticism about the idea that God created exclusively through process. I don't think as an old earth creationist, I'm not ruling out that there are some features in, in the, you know, some earth features, some life features that are not, you know, um, generated through process. I think that's, there's very clearly evidence for that. And I think there's biblical warrant for thinking along those lines. It's just that I don't think God created exclusively through process, which is what an, an evolutionary creationist would argue. You know, and I also believe as a creationist that not only did God create through intervening, at least at particular points in, in uh, life's history, but that we can detect that intervention through scientific means. Uh, and so, you know, in, in that place, old earth and young earth creationists would share common ground. And then also young earth and old earth creationists would both affirm the historicity of Adam and Eve and, and see Adam and Eve as sole progenitors. So, you know, young, uh, old earth creationism kind of straddles the middle between theistic evolution and between young earth creationism but it probably has more in common with young earth creation than with evolutionary creation. Uh, hopefully that helps. Yeah, that does, thank you. Hello, thank you so much for your uh, presentation and answering all the questions. I um, really appreciate it. Um, I hadn't heard the idea of like convergence as a, uh, argument against uh, the modern evolutionary paradigm. So that was really fascinating. Um, I do have a friend who's studied uh, basically like philosophy of science and um, basically some modern problems with evolution. And he had mentioned um, there's a site called um, the third way of evolution.com. Um, I'm not a biologist, so it's a little, a little above, a little above me, but um, I was wondering if, like, especially as a biochemist, um, if you had any thoughts on, uh, basically, the, the site presents four different um, phenomena that are 
basically rapid and um, show like changes in genetics um, such that neo-Darwinism's mechanism of like mutation and natural selection um, can't account for them. At least that was, that was my understanding of mm. what I was presenting. And I was wondering basically if um, you would, if you would believe that would be um, a good line of approach for challenging uh, modern neo-Darwinism or if you see it as still consistent. Yeah, I'm actually not familiar with that site, the third way of evolution. So I would probably want to familiarize my site before I, I responded. But again, could you repeat, you know, what, um, uh, you know, just repeat what you, you, what your friend was saying is, is problematic or um, what yeah. you read is problematic. I'm sorry. Sure. Sorry about that. Um, so he was saying that there's basically rapid evolutionary processes of symbiogenesis, horizontal DNA transfer, action of mobile DNA and epigenetics. Oh, okay. Is this, um, Good grief. Perry Marshall. Um, I am not sure I can check real quick, <laughs> but probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, th yeah, there's a, a, an idea uh, or, um, good grief. Give me a moment. The, 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 the evolutionary biologist is at the university of Chicago. Oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name now. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shapiro? That's it. Thanks, James Shapiro. It happens mm -hmm. as you get older, you can't read. Well, I, I, I just looked. It's the first name on the uh, on this this website that uh, that Caitlin linked. So. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Shapiro has, in, in his ideas are outside the mainstream. That doesn't mean that his ideas don't have validity, but he's he's very much outside of the mainstream. But he's he's arguing that um, that organisms seem to be programmed to to evolve, and so he cites these different mechanisms that seem to be in place within genomes that that are that are driving the, the evolutionary process. And so he's conceiving of evolution as being, um, you know. Um, kind of non-Darwinian, I guess. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think his ideas are sound. Let me put it this way. Um, I mean, he's, a, you know, highly, he's a highly uh, accomplished, you know, evolutionary biologist. It's just that his ideas are very much outside the mainstream, but he's part of the, this group uh, that would, would be, he was part of, the, the group we would call the the extended evolutionary synthesis or the part of the group of biologists that are calling for the extended evolutionary synthesis where he's arguing that it's these kind of mechanisms like mobile DNA elements and horizontal gene transfer and things like that, that symbiogenesis that are actually what is driving evolution. It's not ra you know random variation operated on by selection. So yeah. Yeah, so he would be part of this extended evolutionary synthesis um, where he's, he's trying to come up with or seek after mechanisms that could account for biological innovation and novelty. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I mean, in, in a sense, um, some of his critique of, of current evolutionary theory would be, would be critique that I would share, right? Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. If there's no takers, then we can call it a night. So nobody? All right, I, I punted my second question to the end. So here we are at the end. <laughs> so a little bit not related specifically to the topics covered in your talk. Um, but, you know, I, the, the times that these days that I have to, this has long been an interest of mine, um, the, the times these days that I, I have to sort of work with people who are struggling with reconciling Christianity and evolution or 
you know, challenges, perhaps perceived challenges that evolution poses to Christianity or things like that. It's often with like younger, you know, Christians who are younger in the faith, perhaps they came in, they, you know, have knowledge in some of these fields, things like that. And the way I always approach it is not whether they have a background in biology or, or not, you know, whether I know more than them about this stuff or not, I generally just approach this by saying, well, you know, happily for you, we live in an era where no matter what, you know, there, we have this huge intellectual buffet right now in origins, Christian origins research. And it's actually something that very much excites me and probably excites you too as one of the main, you know, a, a, a big voice within that, that community. Um, and, you know, I'm not gonna like push you down a particular road or down a, you know, I, I don't think that common ancestry defeats Christianity or anything like that. Um, you know, I would encourage you like think up very carefully about stretching the biblical text, particularly when it comes to the historicity of Adam, because so much of Christian doctrine and Christian history is built on the uh, historical fall but that you know even a historical atom could be reconciled with evolution if you're not willing to sort of make that step yet and i'll put or at least you know with mm. sort of what we might consider to be mainstream yeah. science um and i usually point them to three resources the the stuff come that uh and and gauger or geiger i'm not sure how you pr you pronounce it who, who, you know, supports a really, really old Adam um, and takes advantage of some underdetermination in, in, in the genetic, you know, how much knowledge we have of, of our ancestry. And then, and then I point them to reasons to believe and say, hey, here's, a, here's an old Earth Adam model. Um, it's actually the model that I, so, uh, in terms of human history, that I would support the most, even if I'm not convinced on no common descent. Um, certainly one option that's very carefully thought out. And then you also have some of this new stuff from Josh Swamidas, which is, you know, it's kind of weird, but he also has reasons for it. And he's not super trained maybe in theology, but like, but like, you know, he, he's, he's trying to be careful and, and open dialogues. And, you know, this is maybe a 12,000 year old Adam or something like that. Anyway, and then I just say, you know, but like, keep in mind that the Bible seems to make it pretty clear that there is a historical Adam and people lived a long time back when the historical Adam lived, whatever you mean by people. Um, and, but like, maybe you shouldn't fret so much about this and, you know, don't, don't, don't stay up at night thinking about this if you're a young Christian trying to you know, make sense of a whole mess of modern issues regarding Christianity and, and, the world. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, uh, I imagine that you would think that this approach is not optimal. But I, I'm wondering if you think, you know, that there are there are dangers to an approach like that, a very kind of open minded, maybe you don't need to give up much, except think about a historical Adam sort of sort of approach to discipling, if you will. Yeah, well, you know, um, I mean, I, I actually uh, would applaud you for the approach that you're taking, you know, uh, because the thing is that we, we want to be very careful when we do Christian apologetics, not to create stumbling blocks as we're trying to remove, you know, barriers to the faith. Right. And so evolution is, is a big issue. And, and, and so I've got my particular views on, on origins that I think are, you know, that I feel are, well-informed, you know, from the scientific evidence at hand and that, you know, my critiques of evolution are, you know, are not based on, you know, my necessarily on my original thinking, but it's through careful reading of the literature and looking at people that are experts in those areas who are raising these, these concerns. I, I'm piggybacking off concerns that experts in the field are raising themselves right, as the basis for my skepticism. And the, the approach that, that I take is really an approach that um, I think is necessary for somebody 
who adopts this uh, position or a mindset that, look, evolution can explain everything, so God's not necessary. I think in that case, you, you, you have to go in and, and show that there are, there's clear, this is clearly not, not true, that, that current evolutionary theory seems to have some significant shortcomings in, in certain areas, and that these represent opportunities for us to think that maybe there is something beyond mechanism alone that it, it counts for life's origin. But I'm, I'm very intrigued by the idea of structuralism, you know, in Simon Conway Morris's approach. I think that's a, an interesting way to, 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 uh, to force people to see that even the evolutionary process seems to have elements of teleology. I think this is maybe where James Shapiro in the third way of evolution could come in to play as well is that there looks like there's something here that that uh, maybe suggests design in, in ways if it's not designed through intervention it's at least designed in the process itself um, but you know so you know that's the approach I would take but for somebody who is you know is convinced by the evolutionary paradigm but is open to the gospel, but then is struggling with evolution, to me, I would say, look, you, you, I would take your approach. Look, you've got landing places here. And, and, we, and I love how you said that there's a rich buffet of, of options. I mean, when it comes to the question of, of human origins, when, when we wrote the book, Who Was Adam, and published in 2005, I don't think anybody that was an evangelical dealing with science faith issues took on the question of human origins. And so I'm not sh sure that our model is necessarily it, without, I'm, I'm positive our model has its flaws. I know that it has its flaws. It's not a perfect model. Nobody's model is perfect, but it's intriguing that you do have, again, a, a range of options. Engagers, ideas, my ideas, the ideas of William Lane Craig, Josh Schwamidas. And to me, I think we, we need to move to a time frame where instead of establishing a territorial approach where we're combating one another, what we need to do is, is recognize that, look, here's a, we have a chance now to, to lead the conversation about, about options and, and, and have a great robust dialogue that ought to be interesting to people that are, that are new to the faith. It should be interesting to people that have been Christians for a while, but hopefully it even becomes a, uh, engaging or interesting or intriguing to non-believers, right? Because I think you've got ways in which you could you could argue that there was a historical Adam and Eve, uh, and and in perspectives that range from being skeptical about human evolution to embracing all or even you know or parts or even all of of the evolutionary paradigm, but still retaining you know, a historical Adam and Eve, at least in some form, you know, so I, I think your approach is actually a really good approach because you don't want to, to for a young Christian to create evolution as a stumbling block or somebody that's open-minded. You never want to, uh, you know, I think make evolution the, 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 um, the, the gospel is, you know, accepting or rejecting evolution as the, the, the gospel. It's, it's, it's gotta be the person of Christ. And it's so easy when you do apologetics, I think, to get to lose sight of that fact. I, I'm perfectly happy if somebody accepts the biologos position and becomes a Christian <laughs> versus not accepting the biologos position, but but not becoming a Christian, right? So um, so yeah, yeah I, you know, and again, I think the the strategy that I advocate for has a a, a particular type of person in mind that you're trying to engage. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, just to piggyback on that real quick, since you mentioned who was Adam, um, one of my intellectual pastimes is historical Adam studies. And, and I haven't read any of, re I, I'm aware of kind of the vague ideas of the reasons to believe model. Um, is who was Adam the best, like if I were to buy one book on it, on, on your particular model, would that be the, the book you would recommend? Yeah, yeah, and make sure you get the updated edition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. All right, I think we're out of time for this evening. So 
Thanks, Buzz. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys and gals, and um, appreciate the invitation. All right. Well, everybody, have a good night, and we'll see you next week. Uh, next week, we'll have Marsha Montenegro, and she'll talk about New Age and how it's um, infiltrating and impacting the church. Thanks, Buzz. Take care, all. Bye. Thank you.